If children are the exquisite flowers and fruit of a beautiful garden, the role of the parent is the gardener. In this second part of a three-part series, How to Raise Happy Children, we will address the sacred mission of a parent. Hi everyone, Simon Jacobson here. Part two of this three-part course called How to Raise Happy Children. In this second part, we will be addressing the sacred mission of a parent. This program is dedicated by Valerie Davis in memory of Margaret Mary Mishley. In the first part of this series, we discussed and used the analogy of a garden to describe the home, the environment, the atmosphere in which children grow up. And it's a beautiful analogy when you think about it because it's not neutral. A garden is, we all associate a garden with beauty, with fruitfulness, with a delight. A beautiful garden elicits a certain serenity, a calm, and many other aspects of it that really fit as a beautiful analogy. So if the garden is a fertile, well-nurtured, watered, cared for, weeded, uprooting any negative uh, toxins, then you have the right environment for the fruits, for the flowers, for the plants, whatever is planted in that garden to grow. Additionally, it's not the gardener and it's not the, any other force that causes something to grow. It's the seeds that are planted. So our children are like those seeds when they're born. And the role and objective is to make sure that the garden is proper and fitting and appropriate for these seeds to grow properly, to develop, to flourish, to blossom. So parents don't create children. They create them in the sense, yes, they give birth to them. And it's the seeds of the seed and egg of the parent that produces the physical body, ultimately, together with a third partner, as the Talmud says, God providing the soul. But we don't create the actual flower. That grows when you do the right things and create the right conditions then the flower will emerge. And emerge is a key word here. It emerges. You can't pull it out. You can't force it. There's no button. You can't press a button and say, flowers just blossom. Same with fruit. So let's discuss what it takes to be a gardener and what kind of sacred mission that actually is. What it takes to be a gardener, what we need to do to make sure that that ground, that earth, and the entire environment of the, uh, the of the child is the best possible one to produce the healthiest and happiest possible children. So let's begin with the sacred mission itself. You may think a gardener, okay, is pretty optional. You know, if you don't let the garden, uh, if you don't take care, you don't tend to it. So worst is going to just going to grow in a wild fashion. Weeds will never really produce what it needs to produce in the proper way. So yes, in the physical garden, you may say, who cares? Uh, Even though it doesn't look good, but is there any really life and death stakes, any life and death consequences at stake? But when it comes to children, that's not the case, obviously. Children, this is life and death. And I don't just mean physical life and death, I mean spiritual, psychological, emotional. Because if they grow up in an environment where it is completely overgrown and the flowers cannot cannot flourish and fulfill their calling, what do you think will happen? In a garden, it will, they will wither. In a human being, withering means insecurities, fears, the uncertainties that shake us up, the inability to make firm decisions, the inability to truly trust and love. 
I don't know. I don't know the psychology of a flower or a fruit. But perhaps they also have experienced something like that in a different form. But in a human being, there's no doubt. Not tended to, not taken care of, not creating that the proper environment will create, unfortunately, a child as it grows into adult with many challenges. Now, there's enough challenges in life that we cannot control. So we want to do the best possible job we can do. And I'll put it quite bluntly. I believe, I have no question in my mind, that the single most precious commodity in existence is our, is our children. They are our future. They determine what the future will look like, what kind of homes they will build, what kind of marriages they will have, how they will love, how they will perpetuate any legacy, any values, how they will be productive adults and be the best they can be in making this world into a garden. Because the garden analogy, of course, extends to the, uh, to the entire world as well. So in, in, in put, it, put it in different terms, if you want to measure the barometer of a successful society, I see it only one way, the welfare of our, of our children, how well they're taken care of, how well they're loved. And of course, the contrast is the opposite of that. When any forms of absenteeism, of abandonment, even in a subtle form, definitely more overt abuse and so on, is one of the worst possible crimes, if not the worst. Because what you're doing is taking vulnerable, defenseless, fragile, in, in, um, impressionable children and not letting them be the best they can be. So it's in the hands of the gardener, not the very physical growth of the child, but the entire personality and attitude and confidence and self-esteem and all that comes with it, the trust, the love that I mentioned. It's in our hands. So the, the role of a parent, the mission of a parent is sacred, is unique. And I use the word sacred very deliberately. It's the most sacred mission you can have. More than your job, more than your contributions, helping others, all beautiful. But the children, because that is the only one that, 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 that will imp directly impact it. Not to suggest that the other things are optional, but there someone else perhaps can do the job. Here it's only the parents. There's no one else who's, gar who's tending to this garden. So it's important to us to meditate and contemplate on a daily basis as a parent our sacred role, our sacred mission, that God gave you a gift, a warm ball of wax I used last week in the first part, the analogy, a beautiful, freshly fallen snow, a very tender seed that you are to take care of, that you need to love unconditionally, nurture, validate in every possible way to make sure that the ground is fertile, watered, nourished, uproot weeds and negative effects. So these, these gentle souls, these gentle flowers and fruits can properly grow. Is there anything greater than that? And I assure you, the more we focus on that mission, and understanding the importance of it, the better job we'll do. I find, my experience, that most mistakes are not necessarily deliberate. Somebody's going to damage or hurt a child, even though they're very destructive predators and forces that are, unfortunately, cause damage. But even there, not justifying it, it's usually not because of healthy reasons. I mean, you have the rare occasions, you have psychopaths, sociopaths, un really destructive parents, unfortunately. But I'm talking about in most cases, it's the neglect is due to a lack of awareness or a lack of awareness of, of what's happening or a lack of awareness of the importance of you, the parent, as a gardener. Many feel, you know, I go to work, I'll send my children to school, everything will be fine. You hope for the best. It's not easy to, to take care of children. Children can be difficult at times. They're needy. At times they may be having a tantrum. They may be in places in a mood that is not easy to deal with. No one's denying that. But, guard, but tending to a gardener is also not easy. That's exactly the role. So it is a sacred mission. And we must see it as such. And every moment of the day, 
you have some impact on your children, even if you're not in their presence, especially when you're in their presence. We're going to speak about now things that a parent should and could do, but I think it's most important to recognize the importance of the role. You know, when you get a job, you get a new job, your boss, a good boss, is going to sit you down and say, here's the, your role, this is your job description, and people are dependent on you doing the job well. If you don't know that, then you can become lax, you don't feel you're that significant. So first and foremost is understanding the significance, the importance. And I used to also always wonder when I heard about homes, unfortunately, where children were not being treated well. Why doesn't the child just pick itself up, himself or herself up, and just leave? That's what most of us would do if we were in a toxic environment and it's really destructive. Well, you know, I should qualify. Many adults would also have challenge because it's difficult to move. But for children, it's much worse. An adult, you could say, is stuck. Whether it's the Stockholm Syndrome or uh, it's other factors that cause a person to remain. The known evil is better than the unknown evil. But for children, it's far worse. I remember reading and then understanding it so well, seeing it play itself out with children. For a child, there is no world outside its home. It's not like you walk out, oh, and I'll find another opportunity. It's like walking off the earth. Think about it. Yeah, of course children leave the home. They understand you can go out the door. But psychologically, this is their world. They don't know about a big world and there are other options. In addition, of course, to the fact, are there options? Where, where are they going to go? But even deeper than that, their world is their home and their family and their parents. And when that's disrupted in any way, it's not like the children figure out, sit down rationally, okay, let me figure out what my options are. That just amplifies the point I was making of the importance and the sacred mission of the parent because you are, in the eyes of your child, like God. Is that for good or for bad? You know, the day will come when your children realize that's not the case and definitely you shouldn't be feeding that uh, attitude. But in their mind, that's why they see their father and mother as their heroes. And when something shatters that, it's devastating to children. They actually blame themselves before they blame their parents. Because it's too difficult for them to accept that this person who was there from the beginning of my life, even before our memories are developed, could be in any way flawed. Yes, it's true, it's naive, not real, but there's something about it. It's a certain purity of expecting the most. Of assuming that life is perfect, life is beautiful. And we should not want to cut that out of children. There will be enough time when they will learn that life is not that perfect and there are people that can hurt you. And there are many predators and hostility out there. You need to make you need to you need to bolster your own ability to handle and navigate through that. But there's something beautiful, especially in the early formative years, of children believing in everything. Everything is possible. So it's not the role of a parent to say, no, let me, let me tell you, a three-year-old, not everything is possible. It's full of all kinds of disappointments, and here's what happened to me, and here's what happened to our people, and here's what happened in this generation, that generation. They will learn that. Our role is also not, we're not talking about perpetuating a myth, our role, however, is to maintain the integrity and the beauty of that child's perception. Because in many ways, when the child will discover the challenges and sometimes the darkness of this world, they will have that as a resource embedded in their consciousness and nourished by the gardener, the parent, that things can always be better. I aspire, I'm not going to be defined by my darkness. I'm not going to be defined by my fears or by the darkness around me, because I always maintain that, I don't want to call it naivete, but that pure, innocent vision of life. So now to go into the psyche of the child is so vital, which we discussed last week more in detail, but here the point is the role and the mission, the sacred mission of the parent, the gardener. So when you have that attitude, and you understand the value of your child, the soul, that purity, that sense of free abandon, discussed in part one. And now you really focus on and appreciate your role, the sacred role and mission of the gardener, of the parent. You've set the stage for a very powerful and healthy relationship. 
Because when you take that attitude, then next time you get really, let's say, your child upsets you. For good reason or bad reason, doesn't really matter. And you think of yourself, you know, I am a gardener. What do I do under these circumstances? Now, we're not perfect. Parents are not perfect. Nobody's perfect. I'm not suggesting perfection. But the more you raise, your, raise the bar and set your sights to a standard of a garden fl- fl- flourishing with flowers and fruits, and you have that role of making sure everything is done right and making sure that there are no negatives in the, that pollute the environment, it just gives you a whole different type of state of being a state of attitude and a whole different awareness of what your role is. So on a very practical level, I would suggest, I don't want to call it necessarily a meditation, let's call it an exercise, but to write down a few items that you should do on a daily basis, a weekly basis, whatever works, but an ongoing basis. Reminders. You know, you can put it on your refrigerator, you can put it on your desk, you can put it on your mobile phone. Just reminders that you check in from time to time, like a signpost that reminds you, I am a gardener of a beautiful garden. My children are the fruits and the flowers that will grow, through, uh, grow, that will grow from in this garden. And I feel honored, I feel blessed to be able to be part and have this sacred mission and role. It's like a reminder, a type of mantra that you keep reminding yourself. And obviously, you should do it together with your spouse or separately, but both of you are focusing in that way. That is a very simple but powerful uh, way of keeping it at the fore, this idea of understanding your mission and role. Very often, parents take for granted their, their mission. You know, that's what happens. When we come home, difficult day, kick off our shoes, and then anything goes. But when you keep this in mind, you will become a better person and a better parent. A few other exercises that can help a parent put yourself in that state of consciousness is the three things I always mention, which is the spiritual spa. Study, prayer, action. Cognitive, emotional, and behavioral conditioning. Which means learn about the soul. Your soul and your child's soul. The more a gardener understands his garden, the more it understands the fruit that will grow from this garden, the better you will tend to it. Same thing emotionally. Prayer is a broad name, a broad word, I should say. And it can mean many things, but it includes emotional conditioning. Not just understanding the soul of your child, but feeling it. And that can be expressed in how you communicate with the child and how you communicate with yourself. We'll soon talk about the child. I'm really talking here more parental uh, meditations, parental exercises. And finally, behavior. Not just the emotion of expressing and feeling the love and the importance. Because remember, a gardener, a good gardener, is really doing two things. Understands the the dynamics of gardening and also feels for the job. So here too, the cognitive is understanding and the feeling, the emotion, is the feeling for it, caring about it. You could understand it academically and be detached from your feelings. And finally, A, action, behavioral. The A of the spa, study, prayer, action. Action. Behavioral is to actually demonstrate that in many different ways. In some subtle ways, some not such subtle ways, overt ways, in your life. And that can come down to how you wake up, how you wake up your children, to how you put them to sleep, and everything in between. How you pack up, how you care for them. Now, I want to make it clear. I am not suggesting here that you as a parent are not doing a great job. To me, I am in awe of every parent. We know that how difficult sometimes it can be. What, of course, we're discussing how to enhance it, how to improve it, and how to pay more attention to it in a way that can only grow. So this is not about any critique. Now, obviously, someone listening to this who has challenges with parenting and it helps get, get out of bad habits or different types of neglect or not really paying the right attention to your garden, to your children... Of course, that's the purpose as well. But I just wanted to make sure that it's not misunderstood. Okay. So now that we've established the sacred mission and the importance, and importance, the tremendous importance, I want to speak about 
The second thing is the stages of parenting. And then we're going to talk about actually parents in their relation to their children. Once you know how sacred this is, things we can do in addition to what we've spoken about in the, in the part one. So stages in parenting obviously are vital because it's very different a parent to a newborn to a parent to an adult child and everything in between. So look at it again. Let's take the analogy of the garden. It's very different than when the seed is planted and those early days and stages when you really be very, very careful because it's so fragile, the seed could, could uh, deteriorate. It can be affected by weather, too much heat, too much cold. So obviously in those fragile states, the care is in many ways much more acute. Same thing with young children, as we know. They need much more attention because they have very little strengths and resources of their own. They're completely dependent on their gardener, on the parent. Then, of course, there's the different stages. Once it sprouts, once it begins to take hold, then you may not need the same level of care. When I say care, I mean the same intense level of care. It still needs care. You're still the gardener. The gardener doesn't disappear. But it changes. So understanding those stages is also very important. You can't treat a 20-year-old like a 1-year-old. You can't treat a 1-year-old like a 20-year-old. Of course, that's a big jump. Let's talk a one-year-old and a five-year-old. So understanding these stages is vital. The scope of this course doesn't really cover, I'm going to go through all the stages of development, but suffice it to say, we'll just put it into a few categories. There's early childhood, there's adolescence, there's teenage years, and there's adult life. With the qualification that each one of them have plenty of stages in between. And they're very different in the sense of firstly the child, understanding the child and the child's needs. In the early formative years is the most impact you're going to have, even though it may not be obvious, but it will be obvious in the years to come. And that bonding and connection, holding your child, cradling the child, just showing the child I'm here for you, the way you smile to your child, all these things are vital for the child's development. Now you may say the child does the child to really see or feel, doesn't matter. You may not understand how it sees and feels. It absorbs your love. When you see a mother holding a child, nursing a child, or just holding the child, same with a father, when you look at how their eyes connect, there's something so, so sacred about it, so tender, so uh, beautiful. What's happening is something is being conveyed. Now, this should be throughout life we should be conveying such love to our children. But, of course, in the younger age, as I said, it's even more vital because that like, is the actual nourishment. That's what nurtures the child's trust. I see someone looking at me with love. I see someone that appreciates that I'm here. I see a gardener who understands its sacred mission. So whether you say it in words, and it doesn't hurt to say it, you should say it as well, or in actions, or in how you convey feelings, you can never say it enough. You can never experience that enough. So that's in the early stages. And obviously, I'm not discussing the basic, serving the basic needs of your child, whether it's feeding, bathing, sleeping, taking care of any illness. I don't mention that because it's a given, but I should mention, so it's really everything you're taking care of, because when you take care of a garden, you don't just take care of its psychological needs, you're also taking care of its physical needs. It needs to be watered, it needs to be fed. But that, I think any parent probably understands on their own. What I'm adding here is also the more psycho, psycho spiritual development. And that comes through some of the methods, some of the things I just said. So, in the early stages, is one thing. Then, later, adolescence has its own challenges. The child is beginning to become sensing itself as separate from the parent, goes to school, to camp, has friends. So, the needs change, even though it's the, the same flower and fruit growing through the garden, growing in the garden. It just needs to adjust accordingly. And of course, the teenage years and then the adult years. So let's talk a moment about that. As the child develops, think of it, the child becomes more self, self-resourceful. Um, self, uh, what's the word? Self, uh, <laughs> self-sufficient. And that is a healthy thing because that's part of what you're cultivating. You don't want to cultivate a child that's completely dependent on you 24-7 as the child was a baby. You want to develop and encourage the child Go with your friends, go to school, experience new things. At the same time, you want to be watching because children are vulnerable. There are predators, and I don't just mean that as human predators. I mean also the toxins of life, 
what they're exposed to through, through friends, sometimes bad friends, exposed to in the media, on their smartphones, or whatever it may be. But in the early stages of adolescence, obviously more care and, and you have more control over it. As children grow into their teens and they become more independent, more independent means they still are in need of parents, always. It's just now, in a way, it's like the, the flower has taken hold, not just taken hold, but is blossoming. Still in its stages of development, but is blossoming. It's not a full-blown adult. So there, of course, the key is to balance these two elements of the independence of the child while also making sure that you're there for them. I'm not suggesting that's easy. Sometimes we over-suffocate and over-micromanage our children. Sometimes we under-delegate and we under-manage them, if that's a word. In other words, not enough attention. So that requires balance and requires wisdom. Discussion, sometimes good to consult someone and say, here's what I'm doing, maybe it should be a little differently. And it always can be good intentions, but the results are not necessarily the best ones. And what do you do when a child is beginning to act up? You know, in the case of the garden, um, let me see if I find an analogy. Does the flower act up? Well, not in the sense of like a human being, obviously. Yes, the flower may go through. There may be a stormy season or maybe other things. And the flower may need more attention or more care or more nutrients. But the bottom line is that in the human being, that's also necessary to compensate. As you see your child develop into a unique personality, you suddenly discover things you may not even have known of your own child, you know, the talents they have. So there the most important thing, of course, is to cultivate the strengths and um, predispositions of the child. Every child has its own uniqueness. Some children are very good students. Others are not so good, for whatever reason that may be. Others may be more creative, more dreamy, more artistic, or they may be more grounded. I'm just using basic examples. So taking care of your garden also includes understanding the different type of flowers there are. Some flowers need to be watered almost constantly, some less, different nutrients, different aspects that feed and make sure that it blossoms properly. Understanding that is vital. Parents often make the mistake, we all make this mistake, we try to fit our children into a certain mold or based on the mold of our previous children. We have a template. It's vital to always adjust accordingly. Now, this again has to be done with a lightness of spirit. It's not about saying, oh, did I make a mistake? It's about recognizing the child, recognizing its needs, recognizing its unique personality. Some children are more eccentric, some children are more musical, then help them grow in that particular area. So here it's already now the attention to the particular fruit or flower that we're dealing with and what the necessary different adjustments or different attitudes that need to be done. It's also important to remember that when you're taking care of one child, some children are more needy, are more special, some need, uh, some are, are weaker in certain areas. Make sure not to in any way insult or offend or in any way f- make the, the other children feel uh, not taken care of and neglect- neglected. Sometimes we feel certain children need more of our support and we just trust our other children to be successful because we see they're more resourceful. Yes, but in their mind, they may feel lack a bit. So it's important to compensate for that and keep that in mind as well. So these are the different attitudes and shifts that happen as, we, as our children develop, as these beautiful fruits and flowers grow in our beautiful garden. Let's talk now about, well, so what are the results of this? And what implications and what can we do? I spoke about the stages, but let's talk more specifics. I mentioned in part one, and I want to reiterate, because to me it's one of the single most important things, if not the most important. We live in a world where we can become very insecure very quickly. First of all, there are people who live dog-eats-dog environment, hostile, very much self-interest drives people. So there are many forces, in a way, assaulting our psyche. So it would be beautiful a child remains in its mother's womb where there's no one attacking the psyche and the, psycho- and the psychological development of the child and it's completely confident and knows 24-7 who its mother is, that is being fed, that is being nourished, that is growing, and so on. But then once the umbilical cord is cut, 
is a new environment. Again, it's not immediate because the child, especially in early years, is completely in the same type of protection. The womb is just extended. It's not quite as um, completely submerged in the embryonic fluids and the nourishment of the mother, but still protected. But as the years roll on, there are so many factors that are going to assault. And I use that word again intentionally. Assault doesn't always mean in an aggressive, abusive, molesting type of way. And assault means it begins to pollute the child's mind and heart, seeing different things. So we cannot assume that things are just staying neutral. They're not neutral. There are forces at work, just like with the garden. If a gardener decides, you know what, it looks like everything's growing beautifully. I can you know, take a vacation for a month. Come back and you'll see what will happen. There's always going to be forces that are going to, in the in, in, in face of a void or a vacuum, that will come to do their thing to feed off. It could be bacteria, it can be toxins, it could be worms, it could be the elements. So we have to keep vigilant is vital in this context. So what do we what can we do to counter that? Besides, obviously, the basics of feeding and nourishing and uh, sleep, and the child sleep and the child's uh, hygiene and physical welfare. So it's about feeding the soul and the psych- psyche of the child. So one of the single most important things, if not the most important, is constantly reinforcing to your child that you absolutely matter. That despite the fact there are 8 billion people on this earth, despite the fact that everybody has their unique strengths, that there are many forces, there are powers that be, whether it's in politics or in the economy or in Hollywood or in sports or in any particular industry, you are absolutely significant and indispensable. And that comes down to simple acts like in the morning and in the evening when your child awakes and when the child goes to sleep, when the flower awakes and when the flower goes to sleep, to remind and say, my dear child, I love you. But more than just I love you, I love you dearly. You are a special gift sent to me. You have so, many, so much beauty that exudes from you. So much more to come. I am your faithful gardener. I don't know if you need to use those words, but that's the sentiment. I feel blessed. I am here to do whatever it takes to help support you, to help feed and nourish that self-confidence, that esteem, to do everything I can to make you the most beautiful flower that you deserve to be. Now, it's not just words. It's a commitment. But it's also conveying to the child an element of, of confidence, an element of security. And if you do this on an ongoing basis, you actually will make major difference. I have seen this. I've suggested it and I've seen the results. Besides the actual message that the child repeated again and again becomes part of its, embedded in its DNA, besides that, there's also the element the child will ask questions. What does it mean that I'm indispensable? What does it mean that I have a unique mission? I don't know if I mentioned that before. The unique mission you have in fulfilling your role in this world. And you start talking about what is a soul what is a mission? And I often use the morning prayer or chant or whatever you want to call it, the mantra. Thank you for returning my soul to, to me. Say this with your children every morning. So what is a soul? Questions are going to start arising. Maybe not immediately, over time, or maybe it becomes part of the conversation at breakfast and other times. And that's beautiful. Imagine having conversations on an ongoing basis. What is my soul? Do you know how much that will preempt in life? Because it means I'm not being shaped and defined by my physical activities. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not being influenced. I have the power to influence. In other words, instead of re- not being reactive, it's being proactive. That's what happens when you start talking about your soul, about your unique mission in life. And the same thing in the evening. Before going to sleep, same reminder. There's also a one-line prayer. In your hands, I trust my spirit. I entrust my spirit. Again, talking about the spirit. Talking about what is sleep. Sleep is a way of trust. Where your spirit returns, so to speak, to its spiritual space and environment. To be regenerated, recharged, and then returning in the morning. 
And of course, other opportunities throughout the day or weekends or on the Sabbath or on the holidays or whenever the possibility, reinforcing this message. We don't do it enough and we should do a lot more of it. And you tell me what the results will be. Children hearing this on an ongoing basis is the exact, exact equivalent of watering the, the garden on an ongoing basis. It has its effects. Cause and effect. It nourishes, it nurtures. In this case also provides that message that's so vital. That will be the most preemptive activity you can do to prevent preventive medicine, to prevent other factors polluting that will attack and pollute that env the environment. This is called tending and building your garden. And from the microcosm to the macrocosm, when we do so individually, it has a ripple effect. And we in turn can do indeed influence the environment around us. From our children and our homes, it extends to our communities. And from our communities to the larger communities, to cities and states. And ultimately, we can actually transform the world, one child at a time. So keep in mind that sacred mission, dear parent, the beautiful soul you have before you, to make sure to do whatever it takes, and also to get out of the way when necessary, so the child can really grow and be the greatest possible child and adult he or she can be. This has been part two of this three-part course, How to Raise Happy Children. It's always an honor and a pleasure. Simon Jacobson here. Please go to MeaningfulLife.com. You can find this program archived and then other programs, part three next week, and many, many other options and uh, covering the different, the gamut, the spectrum of human life and how we can grow and be the best we can be to live a meaningful life. Thank you. And be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.